You're a pastor tonight. We're honored now. When I got here this morning, no joke. That buttoned real well. It was loose, and then I had a family. Nine of them, all nine of us, all together went out to eat. Went out to eat, and now you see the results. I appreciate that good meal, and they didn't think I got enough, so they gave me two jars of apple butter, I believe, for a snack on the way home. I went out with somebody a while back. We went to Applebee's and have those appetizers, and. Uh, I ate uh, most of mine, and then I put some in a container to go and ate them, honestly, on the way to the car. So I don't know why I get things like that, but it's good to be saved, amen? I'll tell you, I enjoyed that music. I thought as those young men were leading the singing. My pastor tells folks, honestly, he says this about me. He said, I've heard Brother Bill sing, and I've heard him eat. And I'd much rather listen to him eat. So that that tells you something about my singing. Romans chapter number 12 tonight. I was reminded of a little story I heard. It said a preacher lived down the road a little ways from a group of young boys. And one day he stepped out of his house and, and he looked over and there was a bunch of young boys gathered in a huddle. And uh, he wondered what they were doing. So he goes over and he said, uh, what are you boys doing? They said, well, we're trying to win this puppy in this huddle, this circle. There was a little puppy. They said, preacher, we're trying to win this puppy. He said, what do you have to do in order to win that, up, uh, that puppy? They said, well, every which one of us can tell the biggest lie. We get that puppy. That preacher said, shame on you boys. He said, do you realize when I was your age, I would have never even thought about telling a lie. Little boy scratched his head and said, Give the preacher the puppy. We'll never top that one. (laughs) I'm glad, as I said this morning, we can have fun in church as well. Amen? This morning we talked in Sunday school about the privileges of being part of the family of God. Some of the things we are exempt from because we have been saved. Then in Sunday a.m. we talked about Mephibosheth and how that he was crippled by a fall and we too have been crippled by a fall. Tonight I want to look at Romans chapter 12 and read tonight but two verses and I I want to quote them probably over and over and I I want us to be reminded you, many of you probably have these verses memorized as I do and and, and hopefully tonight we'll uh, uh, just be reminded of this great, great truth. In Romans chapter 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our Father, again tonight, we're grateful. Grateful for the privilege that we have tonight to gather together around the Word of God to study its truths. Lord, tonight we are a needy people, and God, I pray you'd meet our needs. God, help us tonight as your children, as a group of believers tonight, uh, just to yield ourselves afresh unto you. God, help us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. Lord, tonight I realize my ignorance and my inability, but I pray, God, you'd give us wisdom and help us uh, Lord, to just to magnify you tonight, we ask in Christ's name, for his sake, amen. I want to take these verses for the next few moments and speak a little while on the thought or on the subject, God begging for a sacrifice. As I look at these two verses, especially verse number one, I see, as it were, God himself. I, I used to say, Brother Bill, Paul, the apostle, he, he's the writer. Yes, he is. But everything that He writes is given to him by God. It is the inspired word of God, so it is God speaking through his apostle tonight. See, as you and I study the book of Romans, we see that the book of Romans deals so far up until this chapter, it it has dealt with the great doctrine of justification by faith. But here, when we get to chapter number 12, verses 1 and 2, The apostle deals with something that comes after justification by faith. 
He deals with our duty, I believe, as you read this chapter and as you study this chapter, you see that he begins to deal with duty, uh, things that you and I uh, are to do. In other words, he's saying now that you're saved, uh, it's time to serve God. Do you realize that it is our duty uh, to attend God's house? Do you realize it is our duty to win souls? It is our duty to support God's work? Uh, It is our duty to serve God. See, God tonight expects all of His children to be involved in serving Him. God did not save you and I just to be spectators. He saved us to get involved in His service tonight. There are in the Bible no such thing as Sunday morning Christians. As you study the Bible, you get to Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. The Bible said, They that gladly received His word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And verse number 42 said, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. Did you notice 3,000 saved, 3,000 baptized, 3,000 continuing steadfastly in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in praying together. In other words, God's trying to get us to see that we are uh, uh, to be servants tonight. I was in a church uh, just outside of Lansing just a few months back, a few weeks back uh, really, and, and the preacher said it was a new building. They just built the old one that burned down and, and uh, they got a new building. It's death free. Beautiful building, but uh, on Sunday morning they had maybe 50 people or so. And pastor said to me, he said, Brother Bill, I hate to tell you this, but he said, it'll be fortunate tonight if we get, we have 12 people out. Uh, he, he said, we just can't get people involved. He told how that just he and his wife and the deacon and, and his wife did everything that needed to be done. Uh, he said, we just can't get people uh, involved. Uh, Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, this church can never grow and go for the glory of God until everybody gets involved? See, it is not just the pastor's responsibility. uh, It is not just the deacon's responsibility. uh, It's all of our responsibility to be involved uh, in the Lord's work. All of us uh, are to present ourselves uh, unto God. Uh, Serving God, I believe, is the key to revival. Uh, It's the key to building a great church. It's the key to winning souls. I believe that it's even the key to getting our prayers answered as well as enjoying the Christian life. Here in this verse, Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. That word beseech is a very strong word, meaning I entreat you, or I invite you, or better yet, I beg you earnestly. So it is as if God himself through the apostle is begging his people to present their bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. Oh, listen, when you and I present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God, then the real joy and the real blessings of Christianity begin to flood our soul. It is when we're serving. You know, you and I cannot be happy tonight unless we're in the service of the Lord. The most miserable times of my life is when I've been outside the will of God, when I've not been involved in the service. John chapter 10, Jesus said in verse 10, He said, I, uh, the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may, think about it, that ye may have eternal life. Uh, Not just eternal life, but we may have life and have it more abundantly, He says. Uh, Sometimes people say to you and I, they'll say, you know, I'm willing. I'm willing to die for Christ. Do you realize that's not what God's asking us to do here? He's not asking us to die for Him. He's asking us to live for Him. I've had the privilege over 40 years of ministry to sit on a few ordination councils. And sometimes uh, as we sit there, 
group of fellows uh, listening and uh, talking and asking questions sometimes uh, uh, to the uh, young candidate. Sometimes uh, the preacher occasionally will say to the young man, are you willing to die for Christ? And he'll say, oh yes. And underneath my blood for a moment just begins to boil. I, I just, I personally think that's a stupid question. I just don't like, see God's not asking us uh, to die for him, God's asking us to live for him. It's easy for you and I to sit over here and say, yes, I will die for Christ. But my, when we came to that and we were required to die, things might be a little different. See, I don't want to be lifted up with pride. I don't want to be at that point and say, oh yeah, yeah, man, I'll die for him. I don't know. I pray God preacher at that time come that we would be willing to die for him. But I do not know that. I haven't been there yet. Uh, uh, when that time comes, I, I pray God will give me grace. But I don't want to sit here tonight to say, Oh, yes, I'll die for him. Uh, listen, I'm saying tonight what God really wants is for you and I, his children, to live for him. He's not asking us in these two verses uh, to die for him. Uh, he's asking us to live for him. Uh, I mentioned this morning... In that Sunday school lesson, I referred to that clip that was on NBC and CBS and Fox News and all those channels. And I told you, you can punch it in and Google it in just a few, three or four months back when they were talking about that in that health care bill that we now have that in the year 2017 that every American will be required to receive a chip in their hand. It showed a picture of it. And oh, I, I mentioned that in Sunday school and you can Google it and go in and it'll show you and they, they've talked about it as, a, as just an ordinary thing. Then they interviewed people and some were excited about it and others would say, not me, I'd die before it. Young man that used to go to our church, I know him very well. He said to me as he watched that, he said, I'd never do that. I'd never receive that mark. I would die first. And I thought, you it's amazing People who will not live for Christ will not get out of the bed on Sunday morning and go to the house of God. This young man, I know him personally. He's very close to me. I, I've known him nearly all of his life. Uh, he used to be very active in our church up until a few years ago and he dropped out. Uh, listen, he, he no longer will even come to church. Uh, but yet he says, I would die before I would do that. Uh, oh, listen, unless you and I get our mind off of dying... Uh, Let's begin to get our mind centered upon living for the Lord Jesus Christ and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God wants you and I really to die to self, to die to self and live for Him. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 31, Paul said, I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. Oh, every morning it would do us good to get up and look into the mirror as we prepare to, to meet the day and say, God, uh, help me this day to die to self and live for you one more day. One more day, just a day at a time. Uh, Die to self and live for the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse number 31, the apostle said, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Listen, God, why is God concerned tonight about our bodies? He's concerned about our bodies because they belong unto Him. We're saved tonight. You belong unto God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Uh, Paul said this in Philippians 1.20. Now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Why did Paul want Christ magnified in the his body because uh, he knew it was God's request. Uh, folks, it is God speaking to you and I tonight saying, uh, I beseech you, I beg you therefore uh, to present your bodies uh, 
as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. That word sacrifice, if you look it up, it means that which is to be offered or consecrated unto God. You see, in the Old Testament, dead sacrifices were offered unto God. All the way back when Adam and Eve sinned, sinned yonder in the Garden of Eden, and God slew that innocent animal and took that skin and made them a, a coat, and made them clothing to cover their nakedness yonder uh, from that time all the way through uh, until Jesus Christ, uh, the Lamb of God, was slain. Uh, there was a dead sacrifice that was required. But you see, when Jesus Christ died and fulfilled uh, all of those Old Testament sacrifices, uh, no longer does God want uh, a dead sacrifice. He went now wants a living sacrifice. Oh, it's when you and I honor Him with our lives that God is pleased with us. No longer a dead sacrifice, but now a living sacrifice. You remember John chapter 1, verse number 29, when John the Baptist saw Christ, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. There's the sacrifice. There he is. There's that sacrifice that the old prophets were, were trying to get us to see in, in all of those Old Testament sacrifices from Adam all the way through all of those bloody sacrifices. Those dead bloody sacrifices were pointing to this Lamb that now is here to take away the sin of the world. Thank God now God wants you and I Thank God, boy, I don't know about you, but I get excited. I, wouldn't you hate to live back yonder and have to take that dead, bloody sacrifice all the time? I look at that and I picture that. I saw yesterday how people are scared of every little thing. I saw yesterday where somebody had posted where this lady, honestly, she was in a car, and uh, she looked over and saw a spider. And actually, on a freeway, stopped that car and got out and left it in gear. And it just kept going and went across the medium and over across the other part of the highway. I thought, my goodness, if we had to bring that lamb and see all of that blood, how would we react today? Man, I'm glad today that we don't have to bring that bloody sacrifice, but we have the Lamb of God and now God wants us. He wants you and I to present ourselves under grace dead sacrifice, I mean under law, dead sacrifice, but under grace, a living sacrifice. Now, number one tonight, I'll not keep you long, but number one tonight, I want you to notice who, notice in verse one, who is to make this sacrifice. Notice the answer is found in the first word, in the first few words, I beseech you therefore, brethren, in other words, saved people tonight. The saved, those that have been saved, those that have been washed in the blood tonight. In other words, every child of God tonight is expected to be this sacrifice and to present themselves unto God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. All oh, this, folks, there's no exception. God desires tonight first place in every individual's life. First place in my life tonight and first place in your life tonight. I think as I go from church to church and sometimes you'll see uh, the only exception that I've ever seen was in, uh, down in, uh, uh, in Texas on the border of Mexico. And we had, there's a preacher down there, he's passed now. And I'm trying to, Bob Ramirez, Brother Wilson's uh, the brother-in-law was there for years and started the church. He ran about 750 folks there and they had 13 works over across the border. We were down there in revival one year and it's the only church I've, I've ever been in my life where we had uh, on Sunday morning like 750 people or so. And Sunday night and Monday night and Tuesday night and Wednesday about the same number of preachers. I'd never seen that in my life. Usually if you have 300 on Sunday... My, if you have a hundred on Sunday night, it's doing good. But it was so different down there. And, and, and I said, I, I didn't know. I just said, what in the world? Why? I mean, it thrilled my heart. I, I've always said that was the closest we ever saw 
of genuine revival. I remember we'd be preaching and remember I'm hillbilly. I'm, I had to have an interpreter. And uh, Brother Ramirez and I'm nervous going down there thinking, my, I talk fast and I have this hillbilly slag and all of this. He'll never be able to interpret me. As I began to speak and notice it was catching on and we began to have fun with it. I used an illustration, Burger King, and down there they had some other restaurant. And he mentioned it. He didn't say Burger King, but it was enough for me to catch it. And I stopped, no, I said Burger King. And everybody got it, but it worked good. And I thought, my, we had great services. And I'd be preaching, and I'd preach maybe 30 minutes, maybe a 40, 45 minute message. And I'd get about 30, 35 minutes, and people would get up and start walking. And they'd come to an altar, and Pastor LaFave, they would be deep all around the altar. I'm talking about 100, and then 150, and then 200 people praying around an altar. And First thing you know, you look over that huge auditorium and you have about 50 people left. You think, what's the use? And you just wrap it up. Finally, I said to the preacher, I said, these people are smart. They've learned that if they come forward and start praying, I'll shut up. I mean, what do you do? What's the use of, what's the use of preaching when everybody's praying? But I said, God, give us some folks like that. Give us some folks that just want to serve God. Give us a group of folks like Paul is begging for here. Uh, hey, hey, listen, God is not expecting the unreasonable. It's just a reasonable service tonight for you and I to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy uh, and acceptable unto God. Uh, for today we seem to think that it's a great sacrifice just to come to church. I want you to turn. I could quote these verses, but I want you to see them tonight. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11, that great hall of faith, I believe. The word faith is mentioned in Hebrews 11 some 24, at least 24 times. And we refer to it as the hall of faith. But I want us to look at some sacrifices of some of the saints of God. I want us to compare those sacrifices to our sacrifices. We live, all of us, me included, live in a day in which sometimes I think, my, it's a sacrifice. We think about the preacher preached in Indiana this morning. He and Brother Eric and drove three hours back over here to be in this service tonight. And we say, my, that's a sacrifice, and it is in a way. But my, is it a sacrifice compared to the sacrifices that some of our forefathers have made? Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Jump down with me to verse number 37. Now let us compare our sacrifices to those of days gone by. They were stoned. Now notice verse 37. We'll keep going in a minute, but let's stop a minute. They were stoned. Hey, listen, uh, we think about that word stone today and we think about a group of people being on drugs. Uh, but they were stoned. They were actually killed because of their faith. Uh, in Acts chapter 7, you have Stephen, uh, that deacon that was stoned to death because of his faith. Uh, you have a young man standing there uh, by the name of Saul uh, who later becomes Paul the apostle uh, who wrote uh, both of these books uh, that we're preaching from tonight, uh, uh, Romans and Hebrews. Uh, Later, you find the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 14 outside the city of Lester. You see him outside, stoned and left for dead. My, we think, my, my, I killed a big one today. Man, I made all three services. Boy, I really did something for God today. But my, look, they were stoned. They actually died because of their faith. Notice they were sown asunder. I can't find anywhere in the Bible where anybody was actually sown asunder, but yet I know they were because Hebrews 11 verse 37 says they were. Now, if you can get into church history a little bit and you can read about a man by the name of Isaiah who wrote the book of Isaiah uh, some 750 years or so before Christ, and they tell us, uh, I've read in history where they say that Isaiah, true or not, I'm not sure, uh, I do know one thing, some believers were sown asunder. History tells us that Isaiah was stuffed in a log and sawn into. Uh, oh, listen, compare, notice it goes on to say they were stoned, they were sown asunder. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. 
They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Oh, listen, I can remember, for instance, I was reading it back here just this evening as I'm going through the book of Kings and saw where Elijah was in a cave for a little while. Listen, folks, you and I go home tonight, no doubt. Well, I don't know whether we need it tonight or not, the air-conditioned house. If it's too cold, we have the heat. My, we have a, usually a decent car to ride in and plenty of food on the table and all of that. Know very little about suffering for the cause of Christ. My, we're a fortunate people. My, how God's been so good to us. Is it too much tonight for God to look at you and I? Say, I beg you, I beg you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So who is to give this sacrifice? The brethren. In other words, every child of God, all of God's children. Number two tonight again, why? Why should we give our bodies a living sacrifice? And Paul answers that to, Notice with me, he says, it's a reasonable service. Verse number one again. See, you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Notice now, which is your reasonable service. He said, it's not difficult. It's not all that hard. God's not asking the impossible. He's just asking us, you tonight, and I tonight, as his children, to present our bodies has that living sacrifice to honor and to glorify the Lord. Why? Because we have been saved from the penalty of sin. First, because it's a reasonable service. It's not unreasonable. And then, because we have been saved from the penalty of sin, Romans 6, 23, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we tonight, you and I, are to give ourselves unto God in appreciation and in gratefulness for what God has done for us. It's just reasonable. My, think about it. Man, He loved us. He loved us so much that He went to God got this hill and there He was spit upon and there He was mocked and there He was beaten and there He was stripped and there He was whipped and there He was murdered, if you would, and placed yonder in that grave. Listen, he said, no man can take my life except I give it. So he willingly went through that. We, we willingly did it, see, so that you and I could be with me. My, when you and I think about what he went through, my, is he asking too much, church? Is he asking too much that you and I just be faithful? That you and I just say, my, I'm going to present myself unto God. Hey, I, I'm going to get involved a little more. I, I'm going to be a little bit more active. I, I'm going to keep on keeping on. Uh, when things get bad, I'm just going to keep going to the house of God. Uh, I'm going to keep giving. Uh, I'm going to keep serving. Uh, I'm going to keep working. Uh, I'm going to keep praying. Uh, just keep on keeping on for the Lord tonight. Uh, we should pre present our bodies not only because it is a reasonable service and not only tonight uh, uh, because we've been saved from the penalty of sin, but we ought to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God so that others may be brought to Christ. There's a, even in our Baptist church, we sometimes, good men, all of us, make mistakes, and sometimes we say things that we ought not to say. For instance, I've heard some say, good men, and, and, and it's all in how you look at it, I guess, but they'll say something like, well, I don't do anything to be seen of men. Now that sounds real spiritual. Let's keep in mind we ought to do everything for God. Let's keep that in mind. But on the flip side of that, I do a lot to be seen of men. You know why? Matthew 5, verse 16. Let, in other words, allow. Let your light so shine, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Yes, I serve God, but on the flip side of that, I do an awful lot to be seen of men because I want to have a testimony 
that brings honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to do it. Man, I've had that. I've, I, there's another one. They'll say, now, now listen, don't, you don't do nothing to be seen of men. God said that, that we ought to have some good works and, that are seen by men so that in reality they will honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll see him in our lives. There's another saying, and I'll not go into it because I think maybe in Sunday school I mentioned a little bit about giving and I used the illustration I've got met our needs and so on. But uh, folks will say this, they'll say, well, I don't give to give. Well, you look at me tonight, I give to give. You say, oh, boy, that's terrible. Well, I don't know. I was reading the Bible one day and I came across Luke 6, 38. It said, give. It shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your old bosoms. Now notice what he said. He said, give. It shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall what? Shall men give unto your bosoms. In other words, by what my needs met, then I ought to be a giver. That's what God teaches. See, so it's all right to give to give. In other words, you keep your money in your pocket, or let me, let me rephrase that. You keep God's money in your pocket, and you're going to be robbed of some blessings. See, I mean, he tells us that all through the Bible. You, is that Neil Hendrickson you have coming? Man, he's my favorite missionary. I mean, he's getting up in years now. I've had him in when I pastored him, and I, I heard him. First time I ever heard him in my life. I went to him, and I said, Preacher, I'm getting ready to go to Ohio and I'm going to start a church down there and when I do, you're going to be my first missionary. And I went to Ohio and I started a church called the Calvary Baptist Church of Napoleon, Ohio. Still there, six miles out the road now in McClure. Went on a little while and my phone rang and Brother Hendersman was on the other end and he said, Brother Bell, I said, yes. He said, Brother Neil Hendersman here, do you remember what you said? I said, yeah, but man, that's when we started four months ago and I don't think I'm ready for missions. We talked a little bit and I brought him in and our folks loved him and he became our first missionary. Loves the Lord. You made a statement this morning, please don't make if he was here. I made it. And he said, uh, they asked me to open. He was in our church in, in Heritage to pray for missions. And, and they said, Brother Bill, will you open the conference? And I said, Lord, help us to be mission-minded. And when he got up to preach, he said, I want to correct Brother Bill. We don't need to be mission-minded. We need to be mission-hearted. Now, what you said and what I said was right. Okay? Because think about it. We can't be mission-hearted unless we first become what? Mission-minded. See, I have to think. It has to get here before it'll ever get here. See, it's just like salvation. If I don't think, if I don't realize I'm lost, I'll never realize I need to be saved. So it has to get in the head before it gets started. So it's all right to say that. Just, he'll correct you for it. I just, I was real quiet. Now I use, now I use it for an illustration when he's not around. But he's, he's my favorite. My, I mean, he, he's just, he's, he's, he's one of the best missionary. I believe. I mean, I love. I'd, I'd have him every time. Uh, he, he just, he, he don't, he just don't browbeat people. He just brings out the book and shows them how God will bless them. But nevertheless, I do give. I do give in order to give, and I do, I do serve. Yes. God, first and foremost, I don't want you to misunderstand. I mean, but listen, uh, 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 we still do it to be seen of men because it honors and glorifies God when they see Jesus Christ working through us. Well, let me hurry up and go on. Listen to what Paul said. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2, Paul said, You're an epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Do you realize the unsaved world as a rule does not read the Bible? They read your life or they read mine. That's why it's so important for you and I to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, so that others may see those good works that we're doing, so that others may see the change in our life and say, my, my, is that the same fella that I knew some time ago? Again, who is to make this sacrifice to every Christian? Uh, uh, why? Because it's a, it's a reasonable service. Uh, number three, uh, how are we to become this living sacrifice? The answer is in verse number two. Notice what he said in verse number two. He said, be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing. Notice this, the renewing of your mind. You may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There it is again. It goes back to the mind. Have to stop and begin to think, my, this is God. Man, it loves me. 
This is the God of heaven that died and bled and suffered for me. This is the God of heaven that answered, that, that asked me to present my body as a living sacrifice unto him. I have to begin to think about it, begin to renew my mind, as it were. Paul goes on to say, and when he writes the book of Philippians, he gets to chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, my, he said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Uh, yes, Christians are to think different. Might begin here. Yes, I'm going to the house of God. You know, folks, if you and I just learn to make some decisions, you know, we can make decisions tonight, for instance, and it would keep us from having to make some way down the line. Let me give you an example. When I got saved, I, uh, I just, man, when I got in, preacher, I just got in. I got saved, and I looked at that church bulletin. It said Sunday morning, Sunday school, and at 10, and then at 11, and then 6, and then it had Wednesday and parent meeting at 7. It had Thursday night soul winning at 7. I showed up for everything. I just just got involved. I mean, I made a decision. In other words, and I got saved. So I've never had a problem. We've never in our house, never. And I worked for GM for a number of years, some 24 years to be a matter of fact. I worked for GM. And uh, there was never, there was never a, 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 a night that I had to sit down and say, shall I go to work tomorrow? Man, I just went because it was a duty. When I got saved, preacher, I treated it the same way. Man, I'm saved now. I'm part of God's family. I, I'm a new creature in Christ on Saturday night. I never had to have a business meeting in their house to say all in favor uh, of going to the house of God tomorrow. Raise your hand. We never had that discussion in our house. Why? Because I made a decision way back yonder when I got saved. My wife got saved that afternoon. And, and we were together some 43 years before she passed. And we never had uh, the last 40 of those 43 years uh, uh, we're in salvation and we never had to decide whether we was going. Man, we settled that way back yonder. So you can make decisions now. You can present your bodies tonight as a living sacrifice, holding acceptable unto God and just say, you know, there's some things that I haven't been doing that I'm going to begin doing. Lord, by your grace and your help, I'm just going to make it part of my life and just begin to do it. Last tonight, how long should this sacrifice be for? Paul, again, he answers that not here in Romans, but he answers it in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. I am now ready to be offered the time of my departure is at hand. Verse 7, he said, I fought a good fight. Notice, I fought a good fight. I've, kept, I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, that righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Not to me only, but unto all of them that love his appearing. I mean, Paul said, I fought that good fight, man. I've kept the faith. I, I made a decision to serve God, and I presented myself unto him that he'd take me and use me for his honor and for his glory. Let you and I tonight to renew our covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll close with this. Listen to the words of that great missionary, David Livingston. Great mystery to Africa. I read just a month or so ago, I came across this little article. He said this. He said, people talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be called the sacrifice, which is simply paid back as a small part of the great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? Is that a sacrifice? which brings its own best reward in healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good and the peace of mind and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter, away with the word in such a view and with such a thought. It was emphatically no sacrifice. Rather, it was a privilege to serve God. And that's the way it ought to be with you and I tonight. We ought to say, my has not been a sacrifice, but it has been a privilege. I was in a motorhome down in Payne, Ohio with the walkers some years ago, and I traveled alone. 
and uh, good people. They meant well, and, and, and we all, you know, we, we all are like this, but I remember they said one time, Brother Bill, uh, Pastor uh, Brother, uh, Dr. Walker's wife, uh, Evangelist Walker's wife said, we were thinking about you and how lonely and, and, and how, how it must be living there in that motorhome so much. I didn't want to upset her, but no loneliness really involved. I mean, I love it. It's a privilege. I sat back there. Well, I'm getting older now. I used to sit back there. I slept a little while today. I used to think sleeping was Neil Hendrickson when I was a young man. He's a little older than I am. I was in my 30s when I first brought him in. I, I didn't think about offering a fellow a bed in the middle of the day. I was young, man. Beds are for lazy people, I thought. On Sunday, I thought now. See, we grow and we mature and we learn better. And uh, I was 30 years old, man. You couldn't get me to bed on Sunday. I mean, I could go to bed at midnight and get up at 4 and I'm fine. Man, I'm ready. Man, things have changed a lot in the last few years. That Brother Hendricks went in and invited him to our house, and we had dinner, took him out for dinner, sat in my house, just sat around talking. And his brother Bill, he said, his girl, have you got a place somewhere where I can just lay down for a few moments? I've never told him this. Please don't tell him. Uh, I said, well, sure. But in my mind, I'm thinking, Sunday in the middle of the day, 2 o'clock? Man, bedtime ain't till 10 or 11 at night, I'm thinking. Now, I was so glad when your preacher said last week, I was in Ohio, and he texted me and said, we got a prophet's team, and I said, glory to God. I straightened it up, and you can never tell anybody's laid on it, but I laid back there and slept a good 45 minutes today. And I was almost mad because I had to get up. Things change as we get older. Listen, folks, thank God tonight for the privilege that we have to serve God. When Paul says in this passage, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, notice now that ye, brothers and sisters, you children of God, present your bodies, not a death sacrifice, but a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, folks, tonight we just need a mindset. That mindset to say, you know, I'm just going to yield myself to God. God, what is it you want me to do? God, you will do it to me. I'll do it. I'm just going to surrender. As Paul did on the road to Damascus, I said, well, a better example may be over in Isaiah chapter 6. And Isaiah said, Lord, here's me. Said me. Willing to do whatever God wanted him to do. That's all God's asking you and I tonight, just to present ourselves. Listen, this church is to continue to go and grow for the glory of God. You don't have to have a thousand people to do it. Man, if the folks that are here present themselves afresh unto God, say, Lord, here and I use me. God, help me to honor you and help me to glorify you in my daily life. God, help me to live pleasing unto you. Would you stand tonight? As the pianist comes and begins to play softly, our Father, tonight we are grateful. Grateful for these moments you've given us tonight to...